away in Sterling is the great man himself, Neil. Hi, Neil. Neil will be with us oh. until oh. 8 o'clock. And if you're still stuck for a New Year's resolution, he's on hand to provide a little bit of inspiration. Coming up tonight, we'll meet an inspir inspirational young campaigner who is challenging our panel and you at home to make a special act of kindness every day. You'll also get the least boring political review on the telly as we look back on a whirlwind year inside Westminster. Plus, Neil and I will speak to a genuine expert on how to keep your New Year's resolution. I can't even remember what mine was last year, actually. Well, perhaps I can remember in the break. And what is your New Year's tipple? Is it a classic malt like Neil or something a bit more adventurous? To round off the show, we'll have a cocktail tasting session. I'm looking forward to that live in the studio to pick the ultimate beverage for bringing in the bells. All of that and more coming up between now and eight o'clock. You'll not want to miss it. But before we hear from Neil, let's get an update on the latest news headlines from Ray Addison. Thanks, Emily. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. Pope Francis has spoken publicly for the first time since the death of former Pope Benedict, who passed away this morning aged 95. The pontiff said his predecessor was a noble, kind man who was a gift to the church. King Charles has sent his condolences to Pope Francis, recalling Pope Benedict's constant efforts to promote peace and goodwill. Pope Benedict became head of the Catholic Church in 2005 when he stepped down due to ill health in 2013 he became the first pope to do so in 600 years. Former Archbishop of Canterbury, the Most Reverend Dr Rowan Williams, spoke to us about Pope Benedict's visit to the United Kingdom. The first time that a pope had officially visited the United Kingdom, certainly the first time that Pope and Archbishop had stood together at that shrine. And for, for me, it was a moment of, of extraordinary depth to be alongside this very, very great, very substantial man and be able to pray together and, if you like, to, to discover our unity at the deepest level. Four lionesses who won the women's Euros earlier this year are among those recognised in the New Year honours list, the first to be issued by King Charles. Captain Leah Williamson has been made an OBE, whilst Lucy Bronze, Beth Mead and Ellen White have all been given MBEs. GB News's very own presenter Anne Diamond has received an OBE for services to public health and charity. And Queen guitarist and animal welfare campaigner Brian May has received a knighthood. It's a, it's a nice surprise to, um, to have this honour put upon me. I also think it's, um, it comes with a responsibility to behave, uh, well, I guess to continue to behave in a way which uh, benefits the country and the rest of the population here and, and the world as well. You know, but I take this respons responsibility quite seriously anyway. The government has confirmed that anyone travelling directly from China to England from the 5th of January must show a negative Covid test before departure. There are no direct flights from China to Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland, but the government says it will work with devolved administrations to ensure measures are implemented there too. It's amid concerns of surging cases in China following an easing of restrictions there. France, Spain and the US have also introduced similar rules. Russia's defence ministry says 82 of their soldiers who were captured by Ukraine have now been released in the latest prisoner exchange between the two sides. Ukraine is yet to comment on those claims. Meanwhile, the mayor of Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, says 10 explosions have been heard in the city. That's after air raid sirens were sounded in every region of the country. At least one person was killed. And in Yorkshire, Scarborough Council have been forced to cancel tonight's New Year's Eve celebrations thanks to an unexpected visitor, an Arctic walrus. It's thought to be the first time that one has been spotted in the county. The animal has drawn crowds to the harbour on New Year's Eve, wildlife experts saying he's likely taking a bit of a break before continuing his journey north. We're on TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio. You're watching GB News. Back now to Emily. New Year incoming. 
and still were being beaten around the head with the same old stories. In a few hours, we welcome 2023, but as far as our leaders and their lackeys are concerned, it might as well be Groundhog Day. I look at the headlines on this last day of 2022 and what do I see? Covid, Ukraine and climate change. Folk nuttier than anything found in a selection box are talking about bringing back face masks. God help us, everyone. Let's remind everyone for the umpteenth time that Covid is now no more dangerous to most than the common cold, but still the talk is of the pandemic. Same old, same old. I speak to people every day and hear real stories about real struggles. At first, when asked how are things, most smile and say they're fine. Spend a few minutes in conversation, though, and the stories come. Real fears about making ends meet, keeping jobs, keeping homes, businesses, the dreadful emotional toll on children. So much of the suffering on account of our leaders prioritising everyone other than the people born and bred and living here today. Uncounted numbers of the people of Great Britain are cold and hungry in their homes, without access to GP and hospital appointments, while billions of pounds are sent out of the country. Workers of all sorts are striking for better pay and being pilloried by the same media that just as enthusiastically held them up as saints. The very people we were encouraged to regard as heroes five minutes ago, nurses, delivery drivers, postal workers, supermarket workers, and others who remained at the coalface of working life while millions were told to stay at home in their pyjamas, are now being maligned as virtual enemies of the state for having the temerity to ask for better pay and conditions. All of it in the midst of a cost of lockdown crisis created and inflicted by politicians more interested in the bankers, the markets and the corporations than the plight of the very people they are elected to serve. A blatant exercise in dividing the population yet further, keeping us at each other's throats and too distracted to raise our heads and see the travesty of leadership all around. If they can't split us up on the grounds of race or sex, then they seek to sow division among the working people. Divide and rule, another story so old the pages are falling out of the book, while the real stories are largely ignored. Uncounted numbers of the put-upon people of Great Britain, young and old, fit and infirm, are dying of causes unrelated to COVID. When deaths could be attributed to COVID, the toll was counted daily. Those numbers were the foundation of the fear porn concocted by government nudge units. It was a tolling bell of death to keep us apart from one another, while the economy was ruthlessly trashed, the wealth shoveled upwards into the pockets of the already rich. More recently, the inconvenient public have been dying of something else in greater numbers than during the pandemic. This is undeniable, based on ONS figures of excess deaths. But hardly anyone in authority or in the media seems willing to mention it, far less to openly discuss what might be causing blood clots in veins and arteries, hearts abruptly stopping beating, strokes, all manner of fit young people face-planting on the field of play or dying in their beds. Scores of us have said all of this over and over again, asked the same questions until we're blue in the face and still no meaningful answers come, far less acknowledgement of wrongdoing. The elephant has been in the room so long now, if it's not careful, it might die soon too, presumably of blood clots or a swollen heart or just the cold and hunger. A paper in the Journal of Medical Ethics has found that booster vaccine mandates are causing more harm than good for younger people and has called out for the halting of the rollout and for payment of compensation to those who have suffered serious consequences. The authors describe a profound lack of transparency in scientific and regulatory policy making. The suspension of the rollout and compensation for those injured or dead is needed, according to the authors, to begin what will be a long process of rebuilding trust in public health. Trust in public health? Too many are looking at that notion as it shrinks to a dot in the rearview mirror. And yet, what do we see? Only the continued push for more jabs, for COVID, for flu, and for God knows what next. Imminently, anyone arriving from China must be tested for COVID, presumably using those same PCR tests that don't actually find COVID or else be fully vaccinated, whatever that even means these days. Have we learned nothing? Apparently not. As I say, Groundhog Day. In Ukraine, the warmongers continue to make their killings on the field of battle, in the streets, and in relation to profits for the military-industrial complex. Shares in giant defence contractors Lockheed Martin, Boeing, or Northrop Grumman, anyone. And then there's the so-called climate crisis, 
As 2022 draws to a close, they're calling it the hottest year on record. These claims are made by the government's own researchers. The challenges from esteemed scientists disputing that orthodoxy fall on deaf ears, are silenced and ridiculed, along with all the other voices the powers that be would prefer did not exist. Studies estimate that 5 million people die every year on account of climate, 500,000 from the heat and 4.5 million from the cold. Are we to assume the so-called experts would prefer 2022 to have been the coldest year on record? I'm sick and tired of the whole damn thing. On Hogmanay of all days, I only wish I could put the old news behind me and look ahead. And yet, how can I? How can any of us that are wide awake to the evil madness around us? And I use the word evil deliberately. I've said before that we are in an abusive relationship with our government, and so it goes on, as far as I'm concerned. I honestly feel the relentless push to keep us down with fear of pestilence, fear of war, fear of the ending of the world is the equivalent of a sustained beating designed once and for all to knock the last of the spirit out of us so that finally we shut up and do as we're told. But here's the thing, that spirit is not vanquished. Instead, and on the contrary, in the hearts and minds of enough of us, that spirit has been ignited into flame. I often mention the letters I receive from all over the world, but only because every one of them reminds me of all those whose lives have been turned upside down and yet still remember what it means to be free people and to have faith. Yesterday alone, I received 35 cards and letters from all over the world. From the state of Victoria in Australia, Alana wrote, It's difficult to express my frustration that there's no political leader who has the fortitude or will to stand up for what is right and to free us from the shackles I fear are getting tighter on our lives. My dear mum passed away four months ago, and I'm glad she's no longer here to bear witness to what is happening in this once great country. I lost two years of mum's life before she passed away because she was locked up in a nursing home. She bore seven children, was married 52 years to our late dear dad. I'll never, ever erase from my memory hearing her cry on the phone, wondering why we weren't visiting her. Her mental capacity declined rapidly due to her isolation. However, my mum was an astute lady and could see Marxism creeping into our schools 30 years ago. She saw this coming long ago. She instilled in us a deep faith in God. So I pray that things will be put right in this world. To the world, she was but one, but to us, she was the world. I wish you and your family a wonderful Christmas that brings light and hope for the new year. Light and hope. That's what the new year, every new year, should be about. The more people each of us speaks out to in the world, the better. The more we share, the more reassurance we provide one another, the stronger we are. That's where the hope lies and the promise of brighter days sooner or later. Amanda from London wrote, Here I am, another one, writing to someone I've never met but hope to one day. We will win, of that I feel quite sure. Good always triumphs over evil in the end. It's funny, I've never used the word evil in my 64 years, but find myself using it lately. Over and over, the letters echo one another, talk of sensing evil, of light and dark and good and bad. One after another declares defiance over the years too. Joan from Birmingham writes, I really hope you get this letter, Neil. We as a family took no notice of lockdown rules and remained close. Nothing and nobody was going to keep us from our children and grandchildren. It was so heartbreaking to watch other families follow the so-called science. We are winning, Neil. The light is flooding the earth each day. The truth will out. So many of us on this journey of waking up have described drifting apart from old acquaintances, but making contact with a whole new tribe. The Sims family from Canada up sticks altogether in search of freedom, finding a new home in the state of Alberta. It's great living in a freedom-loving province, they wrote. This is what gives me hope for the year ahead, because this whole bizarre experience has brought me into contact with people I would otherwise never have met. I'm invited to share all manner of family news and so reminded that while we might be separated by thousands of miles, we are close in the ways that matter. We can go to restaurants and swimming pools and life is almost normal, say the Sims family. Imagine that people in Canada have had to leave one home in search of another so that they might feel free enough to go swimming. I can honestly say I never thought I'd live to see such times. The Sims also sent me a postcard with a quote from Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. The books and movies have been dear to my family for years. 
We visited New Zealand together several times back in the days when New Zealand was a free country and saw locations used for the filming. Our kids talk about them all the time. The quote is from the Fellowship of the Ring. The hobbit Frodo Baggins feels all but overwhelmed by the enormity of the task ahead of him and tells the wizard Gandalf, I wish it need not have happened in my time. So do I, replies Gandalf, and so do all who live to see such times. But it's not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. Happy New Year to all dear friends and fellow travellers. Very much indeed, Neil. Now we'd love to hear what you think at home about what Neil's had to say there. Remember, you can tweet and email us. Our email address is, as always, gbviews at gbnews.uk. You can also tweet me as well at gbnews, and I'll try to get to some of your comments later in the show. Now, I will be introducing my wonderful panel. Of course, Neil will also be with us throughout the show, but keeping me company in the studio this evening is the podcaster Tom Buick. There he is. And the lawyer and broadcaster Andrew Aborn. Now, Tom, is there anything you'd like to pick up on in that monologue that Neil just delivered? Yeah, absolutely. Starting by saying to Neil, to you and yours, your loved ones, a very happy new year. And uh, I'm delighted to have sat on this sofa many times over the course of 2022 and listened to Neil's monologues. And actually listening to that one, I think if you haven't heard any of Neil's previous monologues, that to me felt like the greatest his hits of all the monologues uh, <laughs> that he's delivered so far. So it was COVID vaccines. Um, it was, of course, uh, uh, you know, the whole management of the pandemic. It's the socio-economic conditions of this country. And actually, to be fair to Neil, he's often been at the forefront of putting out what some might consider unfashionable views, sometimes conspiracy views, which have actually gone mainstream. So to that, Neil... You've done a fantastic service to all those viewers and uh, others uh, who watch GB News. Um, Thank you, but Tom. The one thing I do want to pick up on, um, not only it sort of offended me, but it, it certainly jarred with me, was the point about control and uh, Ukraine. And, and please correct me if I'm wrong on this, but almost the suggestion that uh, it's not really about democracy and freedom, that when we sent those tank busters out in those C-17s uh, at uh, President uh, Zelensky's request, when we agreed, of course, we've got 80,000 Ukrainians in the country right now who were offering important refugee status to, to me, that is a war uh, to uphold uh, freedom. You yourself have often talked about the danger of authoritarians. Putin's an authoritarian, isn't he? I think there's much more going on in Ukraine than we are being invited to consider uh, in, the, in much of the mainstream press. Uh, I don't think it's the black and white issue that's being portrayed, Tom. Um, uh, uh, and furthermore, I think it's, it's so important, crucially important to remember all the time that while the, uh, the, the arms are being uh, moved around, that, that vast sums of money are being exchanged, that people are profiting from war as, as warmongers always do, the people of Ukraine are living in a, in a war zone. They have had their infrastructure destroyed and all of the rest of it. Now, it's all, you know, the apportioning of, of blame can be, can be left to another date, but the, the necessity for those people to get back to their ordinary lives, I think, is paramount. And the way in which the war is just being sold to us as an ongoing war, potentially endless war going on, and once, once upon a time it was weeks, then months, it will soon be years. And to expect a, a civilian population to live like that in the 21st century in, in Europe, I think, is unacceptable. And I think everything has to be done to bring it to a close so that those poor people can get back to uh, a, a semblance of normality. Uh, but, but above, I, I go back again, Tom, and I say that I do not think the story that we're being given about Ukraine is adequate or complete. And I think there's much more going on there, a much longer story. And if yeah. people had been invited to consider all of the background, all of the backstory to that tragic mm. and ugly story, then events might have unfolded differently. Tom, uh, very quickly, and then we'll get a word yeah. from Andrew before we have to go to the break. There's always a backstory, isn't there, and a more complicated story uh, with all wars. We know that. Uh, but what the people of Ukraine are facing right now is, on their borders, a tyrannical leader that basically wants to annex large parts of their country. Surely, as we go into 2023, 
Whatever some of the more nefarious motives, and yes, you can argue that back in 2014 when Crimea was annexed and he was just allowed to do that, there should have been more of an um, international response. But this weaponization of energy, which is not just affecting Ukraine, it's affecting all of us, surely that's what we're standing up to as we enter 2023. I don't Andrew. think for one minute that the Nord Stream pipeline was cut by was cut by Russia. And also, it's worth important to remember the the ugliness of what was happening to people in the Donbass and in that you know in that in that eastern part of Ukraine for years and years before the world turned its attention to it in the way that it's been invited to in the last in the last twelve months. There's a longer story, and if people were invited to consider it in its totality and its it, the the full picture, I think events might have unfolded differently. Andrew, do you feel like it sometimes feels like we're in Groundhog Day as we head into the new, the new year? Oh, without a doubt. What I love about coming on with Neil is that we question everything because we're drowning in a sea of information, most of which is false. And there's a couple of things that Neil mentioned in his brilliant start to the show. Uh, and that was about the, um, the ONS data, which nobody's really talking about, whether they're too scared to talk about it. But it's quite frightening. And the trouble is, with the current situation that we have, everybody becomes an expert. Everybody's a virologist, everybody's a, a, a democratic expert on the Constitution and so on and so forth. What we need to do is separate facts from opinion. It's that news. Let's give us hard information so that we can make the relevant decisions. So the ONS statistics, and uh, Neil referenced this in his thing, for 10 to 59-year-olds, apparently January to the end of October 2021, the excess deaths was more, really shockingly, more for those who'd been vaccinated than it was for those who hadn't. Now, I'm not a virologist and I don't want to scaremonger at all, but what we should be doing is asking that question. And my concern is why isn't that question being asked? We'll come back to all of this, um, but we must go to a break. But after the break, it's the least boring political review on the telly. We will be looking back on a whirlwind year inside Westminster, so stay tuned. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online, across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Yes, welcome back to Neil Oliver Live for New Year's Eve with me, Emily Carver. Now, one year, two monarchs, three prime ministers and four chancellors. The UK will probably never see the like again. Joining myself and Neil for a special political review of the most bonkers year for the UK is the Sunday Mirror's political editor, Nigel Nelson, and Conservative councillor and former advisor, Claire Pearsall. Now, we've got a lot to get stuck into here. Who shall I start with? Neil. I'll go to you first. Who is your hero of the last year? 
Uh, well, well, my hero, uh, really, when I, when I was asked the question, the, the name that came immediately to my mind because of recent events is uh, Andrew Bridgen. Uh, you know, for for getting up in that all but empty House of Commons and addressing the the issue of uh, of the vaccine injured and and the, and the vaccine story in its entirety, alongside I would have to say Christopher Chope, uh, Christchurch and East Dorset MP, uh, has also uh, and for longer been been turning a, a, a much needed spotlight on all of that. Uh, so I would say that those those two together uh, immediately sprang to mind as my heroes. Uh, in a in a very I have to say a very thin field. I don't have political heroes. <laughs> Fair enough. Yes, this is only political heroes, but they were very much lone voices um, in in what they were saying there. Nigel, who is your hero of the year? Political okay. hero. Well, I mean, Andrew Bridgen will be delighted that that Neil's nominated him. But um, <laughs> I should be saying someone like Keir Starmer, uh, given that he's ended the year uh, with the latest GB News poll giving him a 26 point lead, which is extraordinary. That would mean that you're um, only looking at 46 Tory MPs being left if there was an election tomorrow. But my real hero of the year is Larry the Cat in Downing Street, largely because <coughs> he's lasted longer than five prime ministers in number 10, <laughs> which is pretty good going. So he has an official job. He's the he's a civil servant. Uh, he's chief ma uh, he's mouser to the servant. cabinet office. He's kept that, that job longer than uh, four prime ministers before him and probably the fifth. Well, I think most of our viewers will probably prefer a sigh of relief when you said Larry the Cat rather than Mr Keir Starmer. Claire, <laughs> who's your hero? I have gone for the uh, Right Honourable Ben Wallace MP, our Defence Secretary. I think he has done a superb job with the war in Ukraine and being out there on the front line with the troops. He just took everything in within his stride. And it was quite interesting that a couple of days ago, he was at the border at um, Heathrow Airport speaking to GB News and gave the best interview I think I've seen from a politician. He answered every single question. He did. He stayed there for probably about 10 minutes looking at the footage. And he just took his time and he was very, very honest. So whether you agree with him or not, he has been so straightforward and I really wish he'd put his hat in the ring to be Prime Minister. Well, he is playing well with the party faithful, isn't he? He seems to always be topping the list of most uh, popular Conservative MPs, although I saw Lee Anderson was the backbench favourite. Uh, perhaps he can give him a run for his money. <laughs> um, OK, so we're going to turn to our villains. Neil, do you want to tell me who your political villain is? Do you have a list as long as your arm? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep it as a short list and just say, for me, all of the party leaders are equal worst, uh, equal first place. Uh, well, if you take your pick of of the Tory leaders of the last year, uh, Sunak at the moment, uh, Keir Starmer, uh, the rest of them, I won't even bother to name check them because I can't be bothered expending breath on on their incompetence and their their, their utter <laughs> pointlessness. Um, I just feel, generally speaking, for me, the political class is a waste of skins and breath and i believe that the <laughs> political uh, climate the political situation the, the political uh, world in britain at the moment is all but broken uh, and the sooner there's something else to replace them with the better as far as i'm concerned <laughs> a damning summary <laughs> assessment of our political class there from Neil. Um, Nigel, who's your villain? Well, I think that the, that the absolute disaster of the year had to be Liz Truss. Um, amazing that she actually made it to being Prime Minister at all. I mean, that came as a surprise to most of the Tory MPs. So the villains of the piece here are, are the Tory party members who voted her into office. <laughs> So you're bl blaming the members of the party? I certainly am, yes. Claire, well, would you How stand lovely. by that? How lovely. <laughs> I don't think that you can put the blame on all of the members of the Conservative Party, no. So I take great exception <laughs> to that one. So if the, if the Conservative Party members aren't your villain, who is your villain, Claire? Uh, my villain has to be Matt Hancock. I think that he took himself off into the jungle on a little feast of his own ego, um, was meant to go out there and suggest that he was talking about dyslexia, and I think he mentioned it twice. <laughs> And we were subjected to, the, you know, him eating things that we shouldn't really be seeing. 
uh, seeing him in shorts, which is never a good thing, when he should have been serving the uh, good people of South West Suffolk. So I think that he has to be my villain of the year. But he did play a bit of a blinder. It seems his uh, PR attempts to, well, fix his reputation, save his reputation, seem to have worked. What did he come? Third. He I can't believe he came third in the jungle. Very, very short-lived, because since he's been back, I think he thought he would be in demand, and uh, I think his star has faded somewhat. Yes, I think there was a piece reporting that he's found a, uh, a television agent, so who knows, we'll see him uh, hosting a show, I don't think, here at GB News. <laughs> I, can't, I can't see that happening next year, um, that's for sure. Um, Neil, so we're going to move on to funniest moments. What was the funniest moment of the year? I have to, I have to uh, keep in, uh, in a general theme. I have to go to comedy of the darkest sort, which I would say <laughs> is seeing Sunak and Hunt given the top jobs when nobody voted for them, nobody wanted for them. The jokes on us. Uh, I just, I looked on at that sequence of events in absolute, abject disbelief. Uh, first of all, uh, when, I, when I had to watch the grim spectacle of Jeremy Hunt walking into Downing Street and into, in there to, you know, to take on the role of Chancellor, uh, how that happened, I, I dread to think what dark arts were, were applied there. And then to top it all, just to, to make it all complete, you know, Rishi Sunak, who had been discarded by the membership as unwanted as leader, uh, and no sooner was uh, poor Liz Truss out of the way, and I had precious little time for Liz Truss either, uh, but in came Rishi Sunak to, you know, to take on the mantle of leadership. Uh, when, when the party, such as we were invited to understand it, had, had cast them aside. Uh, and yet there they are. There they are, sitting atop the ziggurat as though they were born to it. And I'm appalled. Dark humour, joke on us. I mean, the way that you describe that series of events, I mean, all you can do really is laugh unless you uh, want to burst into tears on uh, New Year's Eve, which we don't here at the GB News studio anyway. Um, Nigel, who? what was your funniest political moment? Well, the funniest moment, I think that the it started with The Economist um, describing Liz Truss as having a shelf life of a lettuce. <laughs> the Daily Star uh, took that, that stunt one stage further by actually getting a real lettuce and seeing if the lettuce would survive survive longer than the Prime Minister, and the lettuce did. Um, and the moment that happened, that was absolutely hysterical. It lightened what had been a really depressing, uh, OK, short few days, 44 days, but it was a really depressing time, and it certainly gladdened all our hearts when we saw she disappeared and we got someone competent in. Well, I, I actually won a, won a good bet, actually, on the fact that she'd be out before Christmas, um, and I got a very nice meal paid for me by a friend who, uh, well, probably regrets assuming that she'd last into, <laughs> into this year, certainly longer than a lettuce. Um, Claire, what was your funniest moment? All right, in uh, the 18 years I've been in Parliament, at no point did I ever think I would be discussing tractor porn. <laughs> but here we are, 2022 was the year of tractor porn and the very lovely Neil Parrish, who... Uh, his unfortunate set of circumstances led to uh, him resigning and standing down from his seat <laughs> due to viewing some uh, information on his iPad or his uh, mobile phone in the chamber that he really shouldn't be looking at. No, he shouldn't. Although he does seem to still be showing his face. I mean, after, after that kind of humiliation, embarrassment, um, the fact that he's still uh, <laughs> happy to... Uh, you know, he's been on GB News. He he's been is. here yes, showing, his, yes. showing his crimson face, uh, perhaps, but one does have to... Uh, Get up and move on, don't they? Um, thank you very much uh, for giving us your political heroes, political villains and funniest moments from the past year, at least in the politics world. After the break, the panel, the panel will be back with us, joining us to continue dissecting the year that was as we decide on the highs and the lows of 2022. Stay tuned. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And you view Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel.
Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs and Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there. From 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Yes, welcome back to Neil Oliver Live with me, Emily Carver. I've moved to another desk in the room, but my guests are very much still here. Now, it might be a cliche, but New Year's Eve, ah, oh, there they are, is, a course, is of course a time for reflection, for looking back on the good, the bad and the ugly. And because 2022 has been such a head-spinning roller coaster, I've called in as many stellar commentators as I can manage to give it, to give it a full appraisal. So alongside Neil and I, to give their highs and lows of the year, I'm delighted to be rejoined by my fantastic panel, podcaster Tom Buick and the lawyer and broadcaster Anne Andrew Abon, plus we have still with us Sunday Mirror's political editor Nigel Nelson and Conservative councillor and former advisor Claire Pearsall. I feel spoiled, I'm sure you do at home too. So Tom, I'll go to you first. Let's start on a good note. Please do tell me your high of 2022. Without a doubt, it was watching with my young daughters the Lionesses bring back silverware after 56 years and beating Germany 2-1 in the Euros. Absolutely fantastic night. And it was one of those times, I think, when genuinely felt like the country just switched off from all the sorts of things that Neil was talking about earlier uh, uh, in his monologue and there was a bit of light and hope at the end of that extra time. That was my high. That was a cracking moment, I think, for everyone. Everyone at least would have smiled uh, when they heard that we'd won the World Cup. Now, who shall I go Euros, to next? Not the How World about <laughs> Neil? <laughs> What did you say? It was the Euros, not the World <laughs> the Cup. Euros, no, we love sorry. fake news. It was Claim the men the World that Cup. failed to bring back the World Cup, Emily. Come on, get, you, get it right. How embarrassing. Anyway, Neil, what was your high of 2022? Emily, let me assure you, that is the kind of sporting mistake that I could so easily have made myself. <laughs> um, so, so I share your pain. Um, I would say, I, I was listening to Nana Akwe in the programme preceding this one, and she, and she said, uh, she, she talked about how GB News was written off even before it had launched, and it was expected not to uh, last more than a matter of months. Uh, so for me, my highlight has been this year seeing GB News, uh, all my colleagues, the whole team, really find their feet uh, it has, it, you know, it felt for a for a long time, you know, to sort of quote that old Millwall uh, FC idea, but everybody hates us, we don't care. There was a very strong sense of that at the beginning, and yet now it has very much uh, found its feet as a channel, um, and it's all on account of the of the effort of the of the people behind the scenes, uh, that, you know, the people on screen, and of course, and, and and the wonderful people that have become regular contributors, you know, people like Tom, who have you know I've got to know uh, quite well over the over the months, and and to broaden that, but I, I think that. The real highlight for me this year has been the people that I've met, uh, partly on account of being with GB News, but the, the, whose orbits I would never have entered, whose paths I would never have crossed. Uh, you know, I've, I've lost 
acquaintances uh, on account of stances that I've taken and I've uh, and I've I've seen people go, uh, but it's been replaced as I mentioned in my monologue by a, a whole different tribe of people, and it's been an absolute joy to me. The people that I've met, the, the unexpected cast of characters, uh, it's been such a, a revelation, such a refreshment of my life, uh, and it's been an absolute hand on heart uh, pleasure the people that I've I've met in the last 12 months who have given me different things to think about different perspectives uh, and we've and we've stood together against something that collectively we see as a as an egregious wrong uh, so that with that in 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 short or in long this has been my highlight of the year I've got a tear in my eye after that. Yeah. I totally agree. GB News feels like some strange but wonderful family. And um, I've got a lot of a lot to be thankful for, for being able to be in this position, something that I've dreamed of for many years that's come true because of GB News and the people who work here. Tom. Oh, we've already gone to Tom. Don't Let's be. go to Andrew. Andrew, what was your highlight? Of well, one of my highlights was uh, your claiming the World Cup. I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> a fantastic moment. 1966 all over again. Um, I have to echo what both you and Neil said, and uh, it was, it's like a crib sheet, really. Uh, without a doubt, coming to GB News every week on different programmes has been brilliant. It is like a wonderful family putting the fun into dysfunctional, but also correcting people's misunderstanding about the channel. And Stephen Dixon did a fantastic uh, uh, little article about GB News and how people dismissed it, first of all, saying, oh, it's all right wing and uh, don't listen to anybody else. And people don't even watch it uh, on that sort of basis. What I would encourage people to do and what every, uh, happens on every single show is you encourage lots of different voices. Is what uh, we said at the top of the show is that what we want to do is encourage people, question everything. But let's start with the facts, get the facts right, and then people can have opinion on that sort of basis. So for me, GB News has been brilliant and a real, real highlight of my week is coming on the different shows. Uh, the other thing that I would mention as well, uh, because people don't mention it in enough, and there's too much other rotten stuff on uh, the headline and the front pages, is the great advances in technology, in medicine, in AI, in entertainment, and so on and so forth, which we've had. We've found the complete sequence, 100% of the sequence of the genome. And what that means is that in time, we're going to be able to solve all sorts of diseases. And it's going to be brilliant. AI in entertainment, as you know, my background is as an entertainment lawyer, uh, looking at the development side that's happening there, how you can create content, how we're getting massive advances on that as well. I, I predict that what's going to happen over the next few years is it's going to be revolutionising uh, the way that we look and consume content, as well as getting all those tremendous advances in medicine. So I had three on that sort of basis, but three worthwhile ones. I love your enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, Andrew. There were two little highlights of, of my year when I walked past an estate agent that had GB News on all of its televisions and when I was at Bournemouth Hospital in the <laughs> A&E after a bad e-scooter accident, self-inflicted, I must say. Um, it was also playing there in the waiting room, keeping guests uh, entertained. So that was a nice little highlight. Claire, what's been your highlight of the year? Well, I mean, how do you follow on from that? So, uh, you know, and I echo Andrew's point about GB News, and I'm so grateful that uh, you allow me on here to sprout some words to you all. But uh, I think for this year, it has to be the Platinum Jubilee. Uh, Her Majesty the Queen looking resplendent, giving us a four day bank holiday. But the one thing that was so special is everybody came together, communities came together, people started talking to each other looking at what they were going to do, how they were going to celebrate, sharing picnics and food and days out. And it was just such a nice moment in what has been a really, really turbulent year that everybody came to London, they came and had a look at Buckingham Palace, they learned a little bit about history and just joined together for that moment. So I think that has been one of the very special things of this year and we will never see that again. And the anti monarchists the Republicans, did uh, keep quiet, um, <laughs> most of them anyway, um, for that moment. Nigel, last but not least. Yep, yeah, well, hear, hear to everything that's been said about GB News so far. Oh. Um, and I didn't think um, that the Queen's sketch with Daniel Craig uh, the Olympics could be beaten, but she managed it this year uh, by doing an, another sketch with Paddington. And in a sense, they were the two iconic Brits. Nigel, of your may life. I just interrupt you because I believe we have a clip of that just to remind oh, our goodness. <laughs> Perhaps you would like a marmalade sandwich. I always keep one for emergencies. So do I. I keep mine in here. Party is about to start, Your Majesty.
happy Jubilee, ma'am. And thank you for everything. That's very kind. Well, there we go, Nigel. What were you going to say? Uh, just that, the, that when the Queen starts tapping out, we will rock you. That was taken a while to learn, but you did it absolutely perfectly. <laughs> Now, we're going to have to rush through our lows, apparently. The producer's oh. telling me that we don't have too much time. So, Tom, what was your low? Well, I, su I suspect there will be a common theme uh, amongst us. I mean, for me, really, it was uh, 2022 was the year when the British promise was finally broken. What I mean by that is you think about every single generation, really, in the post-war period has uh, usually kind of, you know, whichever party is in power has seen that this generation will be better off, better access to housing, health, homes, education... And that just hasn't happened this year. Wages are stagnated. We've, we've spent a lot on the nation's credit card. And as Ian has said um, as well, you know, so ably, it hasn't really delivered very much for us. Yeah, that is a bit of a low. Although I do hope that people, come what may, whatever politicians are in power, whatever they do, with a bit of perseverance, all of us can hopefully have a better year ahead. Neil? <laughs> I would echo really a lot of what Tom was saying there, but I think it's been, really for me, it's been watching Great Britain taken apart uh, systematically uh, by those who really are, are supposed to be in positions to, to take it forward and to, and to champion Britain. Uh, our leaders, their, their evident uh, disdain and contempt for a once great country uh, and their, their servitude to the markets, to transnational corporations, and standing by while our heritage, our culture, uh, what it means to be uh, British, uh, all, all of that has been undermined, ridiculed, you know, held up as though it's been a, a great wrong committed against the world for the last several hundred years. Uh, and that, that brings me a great sadness. You know, somebody who loves Britain always has, always will. Uh, and I feel it's in, it's in the care at the moment of people who are not fit for the jobs that they have taken on. Andrew, very quickly. Very quickly. Well, the saddest thing for me are the number of people who've died, iconic people in our lives, both very close, but not in the public eye, but there's several, and it's a devastating list from, obviously, Her Majesty the Queen, Pope uh, Benedict uh, died uh, today, Barbara Walters uh, also died today, we've had Dame Vivian Westwood yesterday, Pele, uh, the list goes on and on and on. Tragic loss for all sorts of industries um, and just reminds us of our own vulnerability. Claire, what's your low? Uh, it has been the most recent weather event, um, in recording temperatures of minus 10 out in, in Kent, which was particularly galling considering the cost of living crisis and people worrying about how to heat their homes. But I'm really, really grateful in my village in particular for the farmers who came out with their uh, tractors to keep our roads clear. So top job for that one. Well, that's nice. A little positive spin there, yeah. too. There. <coughs> Nigel, to finish us off. Yeah, well, we had the best Eurovision entry uh, for years and poor old Sam Ryder ended up coming second because of timing. If it hadn't been for the Ukraine war, he'd have come first. But that was the low point, him not winning. And we still get the host <laughs> There you go. But <laughs> overall, quite positive there from <laughs> Nigel to end uh, that segment, segment. Thank you very much um, for joining us to give us your highs and also your lows from last year. Now, coming up, could you do a random act of kindness every day for one year? Our next guest is the charity founder, Sebi Hall, who has done just that. We speak to him after the break. Stay tuned. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me and the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. My name's Tom Harvard and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. 
I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently, and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Yes, welcome back to Neil Oliver Live on this New Year's Eve with me, Emily Carver. Now, our Great Britain this week set himself the challenge of completing a random act of kindness every day. And for almost two years, he hasn't looked back. 19-year-old Sevi Hall understands the difficulties faced by disabled people. And on top of putting smiles on faces day to day, his charity, the Sevi Hall Kindness Foundation, has been funding incredible projects for others with learning disabilities. Sevi makes a point of saying kindness is my superpower. That's very nice. And I'm delighted that Sebi and his mum, Ashley, join me now. I must say, you look fabulous, both of you. Thank you very much for coming in to the studio. Now, tell me a bit about this new foundation. So, Sebi, what's the, what's the foundation called? Can you tell Sebi. Emily the Sebi? Sebi Hall Kindness Foundation. Well done, the Sebi Hall Kindness Foundation. And um, about three years ago, Sebi uh, wanted to do a random act of kindness for a friend to buy him a uh, laptop because he didn't have... He was isolated when the, when the schools closed. Yeah. Um, so uh, Sebi said he wanted to buy him one. Obviously, you can't just buy people things, and so he said he wanted to do uh, something to raise money for charity. So said he could be... Kind. Could be kind. So Sebi did one... A hundred acts of kindness. A hundred acts of kindness. In how many days, Sebi? Te Ten days. Ten days. And people in our village um, saw him doing these random acts of kindness, and within a week he'd raised £1,000. And then carried on. In just on. one week. In just one well week. Well done. Yeah. And bought his friend the laptop. Um, his friend's got disabilities and couldn't use mainstream equipment, so it was an adapted laptop. Uh, and since then, Sebi loved it so much that you've continued. And how many years have you been doing a random act of kindness for, Sebi? Three? Three, Three years. years. And how much money have you raised this year? £45,000. And who are you raising the money for, Sebs? Lonely kids. Lonely kids. Who are lonely because of disad... A disadvantage. Which means they don't have so much money. Or dis... A, a disabled. So disabled kids. So the organisations that Sebi's helped um, work on uh, projects to prevent isolation in disadvantaged or disabled young people. So that's, that's really lovely because when we talk about loneliness, often we talk about the elderly. Um, it's yeah. usually confined to that when we're talking about loneliness, but of course, for young disabled children, disadvantaged children in general, it's obviously a massive issue and something that goes unseen. Mm. Um, people but... don't always know someone's feeling lonely, do they? No, and I think, I think when lockdown lifted, um, it highlighted that this cohort of people um, are still actually in isolation and lockdown. Mm. So, uh, you know, if you can't read or write, then you can't text. If you don't have a smart device, you can't do it anyway. And so, although everybody else got back out there, Sebi highlighted an area of people that were isolated, so wanted to continue the acts of kindness, which is what he's done for the last three years. Well, I was just saying in, in, in the break there how um, you've got a Facebook page which shows everything that you've been doing, and it really is it really is very heartwarming to see all the activities you've been doing. Now, I want to introduce Neil Oliver to this conversation. I know he wants to speak to you very much, so let's bring him in now. There he is, Neil. It's lovely to see you both again. Lovely to see you, Sebi. Uh, I, rem I remember you very well as, as one of my uh, Great Britons from last year. Um, I wonder. I was thinking about the loneliness you were describing there, and you know, you know, Christmas is a you know can be it can be a wonderful time for a lot of people, but it can also be a difficult time for a lot of people. And, and I wondered what were the acts of kindness that you thought about during the the Christmas period and and, and looking ahead to to New Year. 
It's nice to see you again. I think we lost. We yeah. we came on a Zoom, didn't we, with yeah. uh, Neil before, didn't we? What have you been doing over Christmas? Nice friends. Making people warm. 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 Sevi said he wanted to make cold people warm. warm. So uh, Sevi's been working. Um, with handing out warm blankets um, to homeless shelters. Not so much homeless people because we were told and we learnt very quickly that homeless people, he's been handing out some foil blankets to them because sort of fluffy blankets will get cold and wet. Um, so shelters, uh, Sebi was there on Christmas Eve this year um, working with Crisis and um, also what else have you been doing at Christmas um, at the theatre, Seb? set up a bursary, which means uh, for the next three years, um, Sebi's giving money to the theatres, to families to help them with the m m money. To see the pa... Uh, a panto. Pantomimes, because Sebi oh. loves the pantomime, don't you? Yeah. So, um, so this Christmas, it's been about setting up theatre bursaries and working with uh, cold people, making cold people warm. And our local uh, round table um, organisation heard about Sevi's acts of kindness and donated the finances to go and buy 200 blankets so that they got involved as well. So it's lovely. And it's almost like one act of kindness leads to another and people hear about it and then continue. So this year, it's been fabulous, the amount of people that Sebi's met who then feed on the kindness to somebody else. So it's, it's, it is, it makes everybody feel warm. Uh, I, I, love, I love the idea that it, it began as something that was just going to be for a short period of time, just a, just a, just a fundraiser, but that you've, that you've found it almost impossible to stop. Uh, and I, I do, I wonder actually, in, in a very positive sense, how long you'll keep going with this. It, will, will, will Sebi be performing acts of kindness <laughs> forever now? Is, well, it an, is, it a, is it a perpetual act that will go on and on? Are you going to keep going, Sebi? Yeah. Why do you want to keep going? How do you want to make people feel? Ha happy inside. Happy inside. So happy each inside. Christmas yeah. over the last three years, we thought, OK, well, we, will you carry on? And there was a time when Sebi was sort of saying, oh, if I don't do a random act of kindness, somebody might be sad. So it was a little bit of explaining yeah. that even if you, just because you don't do the act of kindness doesn't make people sad. And what's happened over the... I think the more Sebi does, the more people come yeah. out of the woodwork and, and start helping and one thing leads to another. It happened with Ukraine. Sebi wanted to make... All the children in the Ukraine feel happy inside. And we said, obviously, you can't. But then they arrived in the UK and we met them, 52 Ukrainian orphans, and Sebi gave them their Sebi teddy and well, made them feel happy. I think that is the perfect New Year's resolution for myself, I'm sure Neil as well, and everyone at home to just be, be kind, essentially. That is something that everyone can do and no one really has an excuse not to do. So thank you very much indeed for coming into the studio. Sebi and his mum, Ashley Hall, thank you very much indeed. We're going to have to go to a break, but lots more to come in the second hour. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubry, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes & Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubry, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes & Kerr. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. 
We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Yes, welcome back. There's just five hours to go until 2023. And the best way to spend that time is, without a doubt, by watching GB News. I'm Emily Carver and I'm in the GB News studio in London, of course. But Neil Oliver is in Scotland and he's going to be with us all the way up to eight o'clock. Um, in a few minutes, I'll be getting to speak to Leslie Hussell to discuss King Charles III's first New Year's honours list. I'll be asking, are there any surprises in there? We'll also speak to Gary Jones, who's CEO of Medi Music, a British tech company that's developed a technology that uses AI to select and prescribe music as medicine to reduce pain and anxiety for Alzheimer's patients. We'll also be joined by Professor Basford Planken to discuss New Year's resolutions and how people can actually go about keeping them. And finally, we'll be joined by a cocktail aficionado, Robin Navarro, who will show us some amazing drinks that everyone can make at home to bring in the new year. All of that to come. You're watching GB News with Neil Oliver and Emily Carver. Let's take a quick look at the headlines. I'm Ray Addison in the GB Newsroom. Pope Francis has paid tribute to former Pope Benedict, who passed away this morning aged 95. The pontiff described his predecessor as noble, kind and a gift to the church. Earlier, King Charles sent his condolences, recalling Pope Benedict's constant efforts to promote peace and goodwill. Pope Benedict became head of the Catholic Church in 2005. In 2013, he became the first pope in 600 years to step down, citing ill health. Former Archbishop of Canterbury, the Most Reverend Dr Rowan Williams, spoke to us about Pope Benedict's visit to the UK. The first time that a Pope had officially visited the United Kingdom, certainly the first time that Pope and Archbishop had stood together at that shrine. And for, for me, it was a moment of, of extraordinary depth to be alongside this very, very great, very substantial man and be able to pray together and, if you like, to, to discover our unity at the deepest level. Four lionesses who won the women's Euros earlier this year are among those recognised in the New Year honours list, the first to be issued by King Charles. Captain Leah Williamson has been made an OBE, whilst Lucy Bronze, Beth Mead and Ellen White have been given MBEs. GB News presenter Anne Diamond has received an OBE for services to public health and charity and Queen guitarist and animal welfare campaigner Brian May has received a knighthood. The government has confirmed that anyone travelling directly from China to England from the 5th of January must now show a negative Covid test before they depart. There are no direct flights from China to Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland, but the government says it will work with devolved administrations to ensure measures are implemented there too. It's amid concerns of surging cases in China following an easing of restrictions there. France, Spain and the US have also introduced similar rules. Russia's defence ministry says 82 of their soldiers who were captured by Ukraine have been released in the latest prisoner exchange between the two countries. Ukraine is yet to comment on that claim. Meanwhile, the mayor of Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, says 10 explosions have been heard in the city after air raid sirens were sounded in every region of the country. At least one person was killed. And back here in Yorkshire, Scarborough Council have been forced to cancel tonight's New Year's Eve celebrations thanks to an unexpected visitor, an Arctic walrus. It's thought to be the first time one has been spotted in the county. The animal has drawn crowds to the harbour on New Year's Eve. Wildlife experts say he's likely taking a short break before continuing his journey north. We're on TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio. You're watching GB News. Back to Emily and Neil.
Thank you very much, Ray. I like that walrus story. It makes me chuckle. Anyway, during the break, Se Sebi and his mum, Ashley, gave me a little gift here. Um, there's one for me, but there's one also for Patrick Christie's who is, of course, on the channel every single day of the week, uh, because he agreed uh, to do five acts of kindness, I believe. And I think he has done them. I'm sure he's done them. We'll have to check up. But anyway, this is one of the teddy bears um, that they use to fundraise um, for their charity. So I just thought I'd show everyone that, because it was quite a nice thing to receive and we didn't get a chance to do it before the break. Anyway, we're going to be moving on to something quite different, although perhaps related, the New Year's Honours list. And it's the first of King Charles III's reign, and it's been revealed. As ever, there's plenty of household names among the individuals being celebrated for their incredible service to the nation, including our very own Anne Diamond, who has received an OBE for her campaign to prevent cot death. Now, other notable names in this year's list include Lionesses captain Leah Williamson, who is among four of England's Euro 2022 winning, not the World Cup winning, side to be named in the list. And joining us now to discuss the 2023 New Year's Honours list is awards and honours expert Leslie Hustle. Welcome, Leslie. Now, Leslie, if I wanted to get a gong, what would I have to do? What would you advise? OK, Emily, well, the first thing is you're going to have to be absolutely outstanding. So you're going to be, have to be a real leader, top of your field. Uh, all your working at more grassroots uh, level, but you're changing lives. You're making Britain a better place. And if that sounds like a really high bar, well, it is. You know, there are 1,000 people on the list today, and each one of them, are, are ord whether they're ordinary people doing extraordinary things or they're celebrities of famous names, each one of them has really outstanding achievements. So say, must, yeah, why not? <laughs> there must be some people who come to you for your advice who don't stand a hope in hell of uh, getting their hands on a gong, of receiving an OBE or an MBE or whatever, whatever it is. What do you say to them? We tell them very politely that perhaps they're not quite there yet, um, that they've got some work to do. Uh, we say to them, maybe come back in five years, 10 years, when you really have made a difference. Uh, we did have one person came along. He was 30. He said, I'm an entrepreneur. I've made my first 10 million. I think I deserve an honor. And we said, OK, what have you done? What have you given back? How have you helped the community? Tell us about your philanthropy. And he said, I've been too busy making money. So we said, look, OK, come back, come back when you've actually done something um, on a voluntary basis to really make Britain a better place. And at Awards Intelligence, you know, we're very happy to give people a free assessment completely honestly of what the chances are. But it's all about impact. Neil, would you like sure. to ask a question? Uh, absolutely. L Leslie, hello there. Good to see you there. Hello. This is a revelation to me that people self-nominate for recognition. In my naivety, I thought it was people putting others forward uh, because they become aware of a contribution made, but, but people come forward <laughs> with their own ideas about, about themselves. You can't actually nominate yourself, but if you have a member of your family, somebody in your business, who you think you would like to put forward, um, say in the charity world or the business world, you know somebody who absolutely has gone well above and beyond is really at the top of their game what you can do is go to the government website gov.uk and you can download a form and you fill in that form explain really what sets them apart how they've changed things how how influential they are how inspiring they are to others which are just the kind of qualities that the cabinet office are looking for it's about being le it's about leadership about being inspiring uh, and then you send it off it will go to the cabinet office and then to one of nine specialist committees, health, business, sport, and they will sift through and check how you match the criteria. And then if you're successful, you go through then to Downing Street to be approved and finally to be rubber stamped at Buckingham Palace. So, so when it comes to, obviously, a, a lot of the attention every year focuses on, on high profile people, celebrities and, and sports people. Who nominates them? You know, in all likelihood, who will have put forward Brian May, for example, or or whoever? I think those are the people, the famous names, who evidently come to the attention of the powers that be. The Cabinet Office and the committee chairs are looking out, and they know all these famous people. 
uh, and they decide when the time is is right to honour them. But that's why it's so important that people know, I think, that there is this open system that you actually can mm -hmm. download a form because people think, well, how am I ever going to come to the attention of the powers that be? And you could spend 10 years waiting for that envelope to come through your letterbox and drop on the doormat and you open it up and there it is. It's the prime minister saying the king would like to give you an honour but maybe that will never happen. And so if you do know somebody who you really genuinely think meets those really stringent criteria, then yeah, absolutely, go ahead and put them, put them forward. Uh, and given, it's the, given that it's the, 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 the king, the monarch, you know, la, you know, latterly her late majesty, does the monarch ever nominate, is it likely that they would suggest someone themselves that they would like to see honored or do they just leave it to the, to the, to the, to the advisors and, and the wider system? Mm, it may be the king's honours list, but the king doesn't actually compile it himself. As we've said, the king could suggest somebody, but that person would have to go through the rigorous due diligence conducted by the cabinet office, just like anybody else. It's not favours. Uh, it's not the king saying, you know, I have a friend. And I think if he wanted to point out somebody, for example, in, in the environmental campaigning world or diversity or young people, it's very clear, obviously, they would probably have come to the attention also of others if they're doing outstanding work. Leslie, am I right in, am I right in thinking that one of the royal aides who worked for the Sussexes and for, um, for Kate and William was nominated. And was he nominated by the king? Because, of course, he was the one who, who uh, raised concerns about Meghan Markle's bullying allegations. Yes, this is Jason Knauf. It is a, a particular honour which is in the gift of the royal family. Um, Clearly, there is room, I think, for people to be um, a little mischief-making in saying if the royal family have approved it, it's a snub to Meghan. However, he did also work for uh, William and Kate when they were, um, uh, before they became uh, Prince and Princess of Wales, in communication role very clearly, um, very strongly. So, you know, it, I think there probably is a legitimate reason there um, that isn't a royal snub. It's a genuine um, a thank you, an accolade, a recognition to somebody who worked very hard for many members of the royal family. I worry that some of the, the that it may not be fit for purpose insofar as there seem to be quite a lot of political nominations, various ministers and former ministers, former, former cabinet members, etc., etc. And also, people like Nigel Farage haven't received one. And, you know, he's not everyone's cup of tea, but you would have thought after his uh, tremendous political campaigning, uh, whether you support his campaigns or not, that he would receive such an award. Is there a sort of, you know, they don't want to cause offence by any of their awards? I think that there are political awards which are promoted by the Prime Minister, by the Leader of the Opposition, um, and people who have long service within Parliament will get that nod. That's separate from the public process, and that's what makes the public process so valuable, is that it's not just politicians awarding somebody who's been loyal for however many years. Um, and what I love is the range, you know, the range of the honours list. We think about there's a, a, an award today, a knighthood for a nuclear scientist, and there's a British Empire Medal, that's the entry level, for a Coast Guard who's done 2,000 rescues at sea. Uh, his guy called Martin Rayner, he is retiring this weekend at the age of 68, and he will be going next year to the palace or to Windsor Castle, and the king will be pinning on his chest that medal, which is going to be the absolute highlight of his life. And it's that range of people who get recognised, which I just think is amazing. I, I would agree wholeheartedly, Leslie. I think it's the it's the it's all it's fun to see the 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 celebrities and other you know figures highly high profile, uh, be, you know being honoured. That's always interesting. But in in truth, I think the spirit of it comes, doesn't it, from the the otherwise anonymous figures that that often late in life finally get recognition. Uh, you know, there is there is something uniquely satisfying about seeing someone honoured after 40 and 50 and 60 or however many decades of, of just quietly making a contribution. 
Yeah, absolutely. And in the case, for example, of Martin Rayner, the Coast Guard officer, you've got to think of the people in the lifeboat station who actually said, you know, let's put him forward, let's nominate him. He's not a famous name. He wouldn't have been recognised otherwise. Um, I must admit, I had tipped when I was kind of thinking about who might be on the list. I thought maybe it's time for Keith Richards after 60 years as guitarist of the Rolling Stones. But no, not this time. <laughs> Thank you very much. I really enjoyed that discussion. That was, of course, Leslie Hustle, awards and honours experts talking, expert, talking us through the New Year's honours list and how people get those awards for recognition. Now, after the break, we're going to be looking at the positive impact that music is having on Alzheimer's patients. We'll be joined by the CEO of Medi Music, Gary Jones, who first developed Medi Music to help his mum's friend deal with the condition. See you very shortly. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five for eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live with me, Emily Carver. Neil is joining us throughout the show, but I'd like to reintroduce my wonderful panel. We have Tom Buick here in red. Hey. And we have Andrew Abon in a lovely navy and a beautiful waistcoat for the occasion because it is New Year's Eve after all. And apparently it has just gone New Year's, just gone 2023 in uh, Mumbai. I believe half an hour ago. So I think that's cause for celebration for any of our Indian uh, viewers. And uh, so I thought I'd pop the champagne. So let's see how this goes. <laughs> now I did this. On, I did this on Christmas Eve. If anyone was watching then, and it went perfectly. Oh come on! So there oh. we go. Oh well perfect done. Again. Sick. Now wow, look at that. Just watch my perfect 
Oh, no, we are going to be having cocktails later, Bad. so you know, don't oh. don't have too much. Don't do it. It's a five-hour yeah. show, isn't it? Today. It's not a five-hour <laughs> show. <laughs> <laughs> we love the whole crate, though. It's it's Although I did do four hours on the GB News breakfast oh, show you? on Boxing Day, which was fantastic. Oh, so I love that. I, I did the breakfast show on Christmas Day. It was lovely. I love the breakfast. There show. we go. Have some champagne. Thank you. Shall we come and get it? We can top you up. You can pass this over. Oh no, you don't have to get up. I'll do it. There we go. Thank you. And a toast to New Year's. A toast to the light and hope that Neil Oliver talked about in his... Absolutely. And to the light and hope. Light and may the only craft come from your cornflakes. And cheers to you at home. Absolutely. Thank you very much for staying tuned. Mm. Right now, oh, with all the festivities, we're going to be talking about something which I think is, is quite happy, actually, although it is a bit of a, a gear change in tone. Medi Music is a British tech company that's developed a technology to prescribe music as medicine to reduce pain and anxiety and has created a playlist of relaxing songs for people living with dementia. It's being piloted at the moment in a care home to help the 29 residents after NHS trials found it reduced the heart rate in anxious dementia patients by 20 25%. It's also being made available free of charge to all families and care facilities to use. Joining us to discuss this further is the CEO of Medi Music, Gary Jones. Hi, Gary. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Tell me about Medi Music. So Medi Music is designed, as you, as you said, to reduce anxiety and dementia, but also uh, reduce pain and, and reduce anxiety generally. Um, and how we do that is we fingerprint uh, using artificial intelligence and machine learning. We fingerprint the catalogue of music, the global catalogue of chart hits from all the record labels, um, and then dispense it so that it mimics a human brain's response and dispense it as a playlist over 25 minutes that's designed to reduce heart rate, increase heart rate variability, promote the good Good hormones such as oxytocin and dopamine, the happy hormone, and uh, reduce cortisol, the stress hormone. Neil, I believe you want to that come is... in and ask a question. Yeah. Hello, Gary. Good to see you. I, I find this absolutely fascinating. Uh, I've I've seen many times over the years, um, you know, a film of say a, a concert pianist who's had a long career playing. And then is is struck by Alzheimer's at whatever point. And while other uh, other uh, facilities go, uh, e even memory placed in front of a piano keyboard, you know where they belong. You might say they, they are they are still able to play the music. You know, is there why why is it what is it about us as animals that we have this such a profound, deep and long lasting connection to music? So a, a number of scientists argue that music is a, a natural language. Um, and if you look at how the brain responds to it as a stimulus, uh, the brain responds, more parts of the brain are involved in the response to music than any, any other stimulus. In fact, it's the kind of middle brain, the limbic system. And the hippocampus is the area of the brain that you're referring to where music and memories are held. And, and for whatever reason, we still don't quite know why. Um, they are the last memories to go in, in the case of dementia. And I, I, I would like a, a little bit more information there about how on, how on earth you tailor um, a music to someone who, who presents with, with Alzheimer's. You know, how on earth do you go about providing them? You know, we're all such unique creatures. Uh, it sounds like an unbelievably, you know, uh, you know, you know, striking a, 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 a needle in a haystack to find the right music that would have that that sedative or that or that reassuring effect on, on any given individual. Yeah, so, th so that approach, how you, how you deal with someone with dementia is different from how you would deal with someone without dementia. And in, in the latter case, you'd ask about their musical tastes or um, we, we kind of connect with streaming music services and look at their play history that helps define what their, their kind of musical fabric of their life is and then uh, build the playlist out of that. With dementia, because that kind of choice and, and memory goes, it's really unlocking what's in the hippocampus. And the way we do that is, is also create playlists that are tied to, say, the charts, to uh, events, social events, news events, those kind of things, so punk music being an example, um, and so on and so forth. And, and that's what kind of underlies everything we do. And that's been built out of a systematic review of, of many, many science, scientific papers that look at how we consume music, both as male and female, which are different, um, over, over our life, how musical tastes change, um, the type of consumer we are, how news affects us. It, it's a very complex mix of sciences, including sociology and psychology and, and so on. So, 
Is, is there any connection there? I've, I've heard often as well over the years that, um, you know, when someone's coming to the very end of life, you know, and perhaps even, you know, on their deathbed, as it were, that the, the sense of hearing is the, it can be the last sense to go. You know, and that's why it continues to be so important to keep talking to someone, even when, even when all other signs of life seem to have departed. And I, and I wonder if there is, there is something else there about that fundamental connection between people's souls, almost, and sound. Yeah, quite possibly. I mean, and certainly in terms of processing music, um, we all listen to music as a whole, but the brain actually splits it, so it's generally lyrics to the left, music to the right. Um, and then if you take the auditory cortex, which is obviously where the ear sits, that's responsible for, for processing tone and harmonies and, and a, a whole wealth of other information associated with a piece of music. So the brain actually splits it and, and separates it out, um, whilst we kind of our personas uh, uh, and, uh, take it on board as a whole, whole piece. But it's actually the brain's very clever in that way. And we, as I said, we still don't know a, a great deal about that, or the science doesn't know a great deal about the brain. But we certainly know, you know how it processes music at this stage and how we can use music to affect well-being and, and reduce anxiety and pain. Right, now, Gary, apparently you've created a playlist for each of us, <laughs> and the first one is for Neil. This is a playlist designed to deal with pain, apparently. Really? Song. <laughs> this is the pain. The song selected for Neil is Shipbuilding by Elvis Costello and the Attractions. Let's take a listen. And you hunt a coat and shoes for the wife on the boy's birthday. Gary, why did you choose this song for Neil? Ordinarily, we would choose songs, as I said, here, based on Neil declaring his preferences and his likes or us accessing any streaming service he may have and look at his play history. So it was a guess. Um, it was a guess taking his age and, and, and trying to understand a bit more about Neil, doing a bit of research on the, on the web. It was a bit of a guess. Um, it's, you know, it, in normal circumstances, as I said, we would, we would create them automatically using declared preferences. But uh, we had to do a bit of a, uh, digging around on the Internet and then program the, the, the service to, to basically create something for Neil. Neil, do you like that you tune? Know, it's, it, it's strangely appropriate. I do like Elvis Costello. And my wife, Trudy, years and years ago, when we were teenagers practically, made a mixed tape for me. And, and on it was Elvis Costello, A Good Year for the Roses. And, mm -hmm. it, uh, well, it, long story short, that his voice and, and, uh, and the sound of his music has sort of resonated through my life. And any time I hear that song and that voice on the radio, it, it takes me back to you know to, to my youth and and almost to my childhood I suppose uh, and I can quite well imagine that if I was in if I, if I was in a stressful situation for whatever reason um, if I was to hear Elvis Costello singing Good Year for the Roses I think it probably would lower my blood pressure so it's, it's a very apt choice. Yeah, we were swaying here it's in the studio to that. Yeah, it it was lovely, wasn't it? Now, the next place playlist has been created for me Ooh. and features the song Let Her Go by Passenger. <laughs> this playlist is designed to address cognitive impairment, such as dementia, and is tailored to accommodate a wider range of music. Let's have a listen. Well, you only need the light when it's burning low. Only miss the sun when it starts to snow. Only know you love her when you let her go. Gary, how funny. I did once have that song on repeat on my Spotify. I do really, really like that song, and it's certainly very calming, so I can imagine it would be in a time of stress. Now, we haven't forgotten our panellists. Ooh. Gary's made a playlist now for Andrew, and it features the song After the Love Has Gone by Earth, Wind and Fire. Oh, how sad. Let's have a listen. <laughs> for a while, to love was all we could do. We were young and we knew it all. Oh, beautiful. Love that. I feel good already. I know, that was very nice. Gary, why did you choose that one for Andrew? The same reason for Neil and yourself, really. It, it, it was based on kind of your, your gender, your sex and your age and kind of where you may have been in your life at that point, drawing on some of the research that we've used um, in building the, the algorithms that, that power many music. That's a lovely song, too. Love I've liked all of these ones, oh, actually. I, loved all, I like She Must Go. I like that one as well, all of them. And last but not least, of course, well, let's see what we've got for Tom. <laughs> Anarchy this in is, the UK. This Go is on. Secret Garden, Secret Garden by Bruce Springsteen. Oh, wow. Let's have a listen. She lit you in her house If you come back and lead it now That's 
very soporific. Very soporific. Yeah. The boss! I've got to say, though, that doesn't the make boss. the playlist of my podcast, the Skills World Live radio show, where there's a Spotify <laughs> playlist. So if you want to know, actually, what music I play on <laughs> the show, um, I think uh, Born in the USA by Springsteen's on there, but not that one. But that's, that's still... I mean, I'm oh. a child of the 80s. So. Well, maybe you can add it, Tom. You should add it. I'll, I'll, add I'll it. have to now. Now I've plugged it. So <laughs> I'll, I will. Thank you very much, Gary, for joining us this evening and for creating those songs Beautiful. for us, for uh, suggesting Thank those. I think they were... I think they were pretty good, and I'm going to listen to that song later, I think. Thank you very much indeed. That was Gary, of course, talking to us about medicinal music. Thank you very much. So, after the break, I believe we are going to be meeting Professor Bas Verplanken, who will talk about New Year's resolutions and, importantly, how we can all keep them. So do stay tuned for that. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's <laughs> on it today! I, 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 Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I really enjoyed that last segment with the uh, music, and I did like that tune by uh, Passenger. Uh, so definitely watch that back if you missed it. But every January, we're moving on to New Year's resolutions. Many of us to decide, decide to begin the year with a fresh start. Making the resolution is the easy part, but sticking to it is a bit of a different story for some, anyway. Mine this year is to try and read a book every week of the year, so that's 52 books. It doesn't sound like that many, but... Um, I think it might be a bit tricky. I might have to get quite small books, at least, to get through some of the uh, weeks anyway. Joining us with some insight as to how we can keep to our resolutions is Professor Bas Verplanken, author of The Psychology of Habit. <laughs> Professor Verplanken, so if I want to read 52 books next year, what is your uh, suggestion? What's your advice? Well... The bad news is that many resolutions go down the drain very quickly. 
Um, so what can you do? Well, there are basically three things that I, I would like to stress. First of all, um, there's the what, exactly what. So you can say, well, you know, if I want to lose weight, um, that is not very exact. So it's much better to have very concrete plans. For instance, count calories or, or eat smaller portions. So what exactly are you going to do? Um, secondly, when exactly? Um, okay, um, you may you want to start 1st of January, but hey, hang on a minute. 1st of January, you have maybe a, a party. So maybe the 2nd of January. It's very difficult for people to, to, to think about when to start things. Um, <clears throat> we can also easily find excuses to postpone it a little bit. And thirdly, where exactly? What is what is the situation in which you are going to do it? So if you want to read your books, when exactly and where exactly are you going to do that? So if you specify the what, when and where precisely, you have a better chance of sticking to your resolutions. Yes, so if I said I'm going to read them every day on my commute and for 15 minutes before I go to bed, I'd stand a much better chance of keeping to it. Neil, do you have any resolutions lined up? Well, I, I, I always, I always try to avoid making resolutions on that day that's stipulated by tradition. And I, I don't know if I was listening to uh, to what the professor was saying there, and it was chiming with me that I feel you should you should make a decision to change uh, on a on a date that makes sense to you. You, you know, rather than waiting for the first of January. Uh, you know, if I was going to say I was going to give up alcohol or I was going to lose weight or go to the gym, I would try to do it on a on a date that made sense to me rather than having it dictated to me by you know, an, an arbitrary date like the first of January. I don't I don't know whether there, there, there might be a better psychology around that making it make sense to me. It makes a lot of sense as long as you specify exactly when you start. So yes, I, it can I, I was. I, I was wondering, if actually, you, you know, the, the nice, the, a good tip would be if you if you specify um, a date or a moment, do it when when your life is a little bit disrupted. If, if it's disrupted, for instance, by a holiday or for instance by moving house or something like that, th those are very good moments where old habits are disrupted, and new plans are more fruitful probably. And we, we did research on that, and that's that's actually a very good tip to do to uh, to hold. I, I sometimes I sometimes wonder if habits don't get a bit of a bad rap. Uh, you know, there's something pejorative about you know people talk about habits as though there's something uh, to be broken. But isn't it fair to say that you know, that we develop habits because they they make our lives I don't know run more smoothly, and they they stop us having to think about everything every minute of the day. Absolutely, habits are very useful. Um, we, we 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 need them. So I mean, in, imagine yourself in a completely new situation where where you've never been before. You may easily feel lost and and uh, confused. So we need our habits, and uh, well, that's also holds for the, the the good habits, so to speak. So we we focus very often on on the bad habits, but um, the things we want to 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 do. Um, we better turn them into habits, and that's a very important uh, focus. Uh, and uh, how 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 vulnerable are we, Professor, to uh, having habits made for us? I'm I'm thinking particularly. I mean, I'm actually looking at the corner of my eye at my phone, uh, and I, because I'm I'm so aware that my smartphone has become a, a serious habit for me in terms of looking at social media, you know, just reaching for it all the time. You know, I wonder the extent to which uh, those who are, uh, you know, psychologists and able to nudge us are, are exploiting our tendency to habits uh, in the way that they're developing the kind of things that that we use every day. Of course, that's that's what uh, you know. That's what entrepreneurs would uh, would would like to see is that that their customers habitually buy their stuff or do their stuff, um, and a lot a lot of the environment is is arranged like that. Uh, and yes, because habits serve us. They they you 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 have habits because you you like to do things and uh, and the, the, there's a lot that um, that promotes it. 
Baz, is it better to um, have a resolution that is positive? So, like mine, I want to read 52 books um, or I want to uh, add vegetables to my diet. Is that better than resolutions that seek to take something away, like uh, stopping drinking or stopping yeah. spending money on X, Y and Z? Mm. Well, that's in, in general, that, that's true. Um, it's, it's better to to have intentions to do something than to leave out something. The, the problem with leaving things is that um, th those kind of habits often come with, with you know, other uh, things like addiction or physical effects that, that are very difficult to, to deal with. So, you know, the, the, the obvious examples is uh, stopping to drink alcohol or smoking. Um, well, when you when you do that, you know, th there's a, there's a physical element to it, an addic addictive element. So that makes it complicated. Another thing that that makes things complicated, and in general, uh, that that holds for for lots of uh, uh, habits, and is that we trust our willpower too much, and that holds also for the viability of New Year's, New Year's re resolutions. Um, we think that we can do it by wanting to do it. But on the other hand, what we need to do is to see how the mechanisms um, that trigger our habits are working. And that particularly holds for the context where we do things. The context often triggers our behavior, certain certain cues. Um, and if we, if we trust our willpower, we ignore the, the power of context, which are really um, you know, the, the basis of, of our habits. On the whole, Baz, would you say that it's a, a, a psychologically healthy uh, behaviour to every year try and set these goals for ourselves? I'm, I'm, I'm listening to what Emily's saying about trying to make them positive rather than, than denying ourselves things. But I just wonder if you think uh, from, a, you know, from a cost benefit analysis, is it a good thing to keep on trying to change ourselves year in and year out? Or should we just accept ourselves for who we are? Yes, but Neil, I, I completely agree with you. Um, you don't have to wait for the 1st of January. Um, 40 years ago, I stopped smoking in the beginning of December because I had the thought, well, maybe I should stop the 1st of January. And then I found that so silly. You know, if you really want to stop, do it right now. I did it. I never smoked again. So, yes, it's good. it is good to do these things. It's good to have resolutions and to think about uh, changing your life for the better and do that properly um, what when where um, with a good motivation behind it and select the moment where which is good for you and that it's doesn't very, need to it, be it's very, it's very interesting you say that it's very interesting you say that about smoking my my, my dad many times over the years had had attempted to give up smoking uh, and, and to no avail, you know, he would all, he would always go back into it. And then when he and he, I can often remember him saying that he was going to stop and he was stopping, but when he finally did give up, he didn't actually say he was going to do it. And it was I, I, it was some little while before any of us in the family even noticed that he wasn't smoking. You know, when he finally did it, he just yeah. he, we don't know we don't know to this day exactly what motivated him to do it, but he just quit, didn't talk about it, and it was you know it was gone. Interesting thing is that people who, who who claim all the time that they're going to stop smoking, for instance, when I'm 30 or when I'm this or that, they provide themselves an ex excuse to keep smoking until that mm -hmm. moment arrives and may quite far away. So, yes, I, I, I think your, your father did exactly the right thing. Yes, it does seem like a lot of people suddenly uh, switch switch off and go cold turkey, and that's how it is for the rest of their lives. I certainly have family members who did that too. Thank you very much for joining us, Professor Baz Verplanken, author you. of The thank Psychology you, of Habit. Thank you. I think I'll need, uh, well, I'll need some accountability if I'm going to read 52 books next year. Perhaps I'll post reviews or pictures, at least, of the book on the last page. Uh, we'll see how that goes anyway. But after the break, we'll be joined by drinks expert, cocktail aficionado, Robin Navarro, who will talk to us, talk us through making some amazing cocktails to make in the new year. But first, let's take a quick look at the weather. Looking ahead to tomorrow's weather, how the UK 
will be wet and wintry in the north, brighter and milder in the south, though there will be some showers. Here are the details. Starting off across Scotland and here, it will be a cloudy and wet start to the new year with outbreaks of rain, sleet and snow, and some icy patches too. Also cloudy and wet for much of Northern Ireland. Here too, there may be some sleet or snow, though mostly confined to the hills. Heavy showers to watch out for across northwest England. As these push through on the brisk winds, we could have some big, very heavy showers to watch out for across northwest England. As these push through on the brisk winds, we could have some very strong gusts. It's going to be a similar picture as we look across Liverpool and into Wales. Here, the overnight clear skies will give sunny spells through the morning, but also some squally showers. The weather for the East Midlands, first thing on New Year's Day, is looking dry and often sunny for most. That's the story too across East Anglia. The story as well across East Anglia. Whilst it will be a dry and bright start, showers will push in during the day, with temperatures rising into double figures. Plenty of showery rain for more southern counties first thing on Sunday. The strong winds will gradually ease through the day, though some of the showers will be heavy. The showery rain, sleet and snow will continue for northern parts, drier and brighter further south. And that's how the weather is shaping up during tomorrow morning. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there. From 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes & Co. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes & Co. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, for your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there.
Right, we've moved for the third time in the show <laughs> this evening on Neil Oliver Live. As it's New Year's Eve, I know a few of you will be joining me and having a drink to bring in the new year. Maybe some of you will even be starting dry January tomorrow. So I think if you are, you should definitely enjoy yourself this evening and why not treat yourself tonight and learn how to make a delicious cocktail with us to see off 2022. It looks like we're about to do some kind of competition. It does, thank you all. Um, we're not doing a competition, oh. don't worry. We are going to be made cocktails by an absolute expert Robin Navarro from the Cocktail Lab. He's going to bring us two, two of his favourite drinks to see in 2023. So, Robin, what are you going to be making us first? So, first of all, hello. Thank you very much for welcoming me here. Thank you for coming. Thank you. So, yeah, I'm going to be making tonight um, a British Morito. Oh, yeah. A little twist on the Morito. And the Sparkle, which is our special uh, New Year uh, drink. Sparkle. OK. Yes. Which one first? So, you want me to start with the cocktail first, or I can maybe introduce the company really quickly? Yes, please yeah. do. Tell us about the Cocktail Lab. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I'm Robin, and I am with the Cocktail Lab. So we are a company based in uh, London, but we work in all the London surroundings as well. We are a, a premium mobile bar service. Hey. So we can hire you if I was having a party. Exactly. I could hire you. You'd come along, bring all your it can equipment. Be, it can be corporate, can be private. We do weddings, birthday, all Funerals, sorts of events. You do the lot. It Bar sounds good. Bar mitzvahs. Who has a cocktail at a funeral, Andrew? <laughs> no, but you celebrate. You have a wake, don't you? You celebrate. What kind of input is this, Andrew? <laughs> anyway, for birthdays and celebrations. <laughs> yes, exactly. So we have a, a few different uh, packages. We're really flexible on this. If you guys uh, need um, a bar for your events, you don't have a bar, we can provide it. We provide amazing stuff. We uh, provide all the ingredients and everything. Everything is really uh, easy to, um, to manage to make it happen. And it's always with a smile? Always, <laughs> yes. Excellent. Right, we better crack on with the cocktails. Sure, all right. So uh, the first one I'm going to make is the sparkle. So it's a oh. drink. Lovely. That uh, is with gin based. So 40 of this. We have a little bit of triple sec. Nice healthy measures. Very healthy measures. I like the fact it's like the masked singer. They're all sort of brand, not branded. It's wonderful. They look really good. And can people find you on Instagram? Of and course. So we have Facebook. We have a page for the cocktail lab, obviously. And I got my personal page where I do a lot of flair bartending. Yeah. Yep. Oh. So, like, tricks? Uh, exactly. He's, he's the 2022 finalist. I know about this guy. He's really good. They, right. they juggle and everything. You're doing your homework. I, no, I do my oh, homework. Sorry, I'd like sorry, to research Tom, what do you know about Robert? Nothing. He, he hated Bruce Springsteen. That's though, why yeah. I'm here on the naughty <laughs> step. They do a few tricks for you. <laughs> yes, please yes, do. Yes, here we go. Go, go for Very it. Very quickly, quickly, though. Oh, look at this. Oh, we can see? Oh, my see? It's worth asking. Bruce, eat your heart out. Isn't that good? Right. There we go. Ooh, wow. Fantastic. Go for spiel. What an good? eligible bachelor <laughs> hey, here. Hey, available on eBay later. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine he's taken. Oh, well, I don't know. Are you taken? Man. It's a secret. Oh, it's a secret. There you go. There you go. <laughs> he won't announce that on national television. Hey. <laughs> so, what are you doing now? So, I'm just mixing the egg whites. Egg whites? There's a little good bit heavens. of egg whites. So okay. We put this in this week some egg whites. We're going to make a really nice foam on the top. Which is for the the reborn? No oh, right, the I Andrew know. reborn. I've got to be honest, I'm not a big cocktail person, but I love anything rum based. I do like the old. I think you'll like these. You I will like these. Like it these. looks sensational. So, uh, oh wow! Yeah, this is going to be a new experience for me. This is a new experience. Yeah. Well, I've been drinking cocktails since before I was supposed to legally. Yes. Um, yeah. So I am a fan. Started off with the fruity ones, like, uh, you know, your sex on the beach. Hey. Uh, moved on to the, the margaritas. <laughs> oh, the margaritas are good, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, a bit of tequila. A bit of tequila. And uh, also, I do like a, uh, a champagne cocktail. Oh, I love a champagne cocktail. That's got a sugar cube in it, doesn't it? Yeah. And, uh, the champagne, the oh, classic, the classic champagne. cocktail champagne. Classic. Yeah. yeah. Paul yes, Vardier. Paul Vardier is what I drink. It's fantastic. And if all else loads. fails, you can just, uh, you know, buy some sangria from the shop. So, something for every budget. <laughs> but they're all alcoholic. So, what about the debate on mocktails? Because oh, I, I hear from people who do like cocktails. Yeah, they do mocktails like are very good. Well. Yeah. I mean, well, would you true. be able to do a mocktail? Yes, for Pardon? those who, are, who don't drink. Can you make these virgin? So, of course, there is a new, uh, now a, a large range of uh, non-alcoholic gin. Yes, very you popular. You can re replace this with non-alcoholic gin. Right. Um, or you can do almost the same cocktail. Yeah. You're just going to add some soda water 
maybe put it more in the long glass even. But there is always a way. And, and it's make. incredibly right, refreshing. We're going to need those cocktails. cocktails. Go for it. Guys. Let's definitely. We've only yeah. got one and a half minutes. Oh, right. I'll go, I'll okay. go for it. What on earth is that stuff? Till the end of well, the show. Well, oh, wow. Less than 30 seconds. That looks lovely. Yeah. I don't uh, know if amazing. we can show yeah. the top. Should I start to make the mojito as well? Yes, yes, yes. yes go for please. it. Yes, please. Well, that, that's beautiful. Oh, we've only got one. <laughs> Unlucky. Only <laughs> one? It's got three straws. It's like a communal cup. Well, is... I'm going to have a taste. Yeah, it's fantastic. This is like communion. I, I love it. Here we go. How is it? Lovely. Shall, shall I do this? Oh. Shall I sniff well, well, them? This isn't around. very hygienic, it's, but... It's now uh, at 7 p.m. It's going to come to... Oh, what did you get for Christmas? That's, got... that's oh. like light and refreshing. It is very refreshing. It sort of tastes like... It go. wakes you up. It certainly wakes you, you up. You know, if you can't quite make it to midnight, usually... It's the start of the night. I feel asleep. invigorated already. It's got to be good. Yes, indeed. Shy and retiring before so that go one. On. Tell us what you're making oh. now. We've only so got... So now it's the British mojito. It's like glorified lemonade. So we, we wanted to use some... Um, <laughs> some... We've uh, got one minute. We're going to have to do it yeah, so, quickly. Do it. so quickly. So quickly. Some back, ingredients back in <laughs> from the UK. So the first one was with gin. This yes. one is with scotch, with scotch whiskey. And this is a British mojito, is that right? That's oh, I love it. What makes it British? Why, why is it British as opposed to another mojito? What's the, the difference? We're using some scotch instead of the rum. Oh, ah, there you scotch. go. Scotch? Scotch in mojito. Good heavens. Oh. It's, uh, it's a little bit a mix between a mojito yeah. and a mint julep. Oh, oh good, yes. good I combination. I love it. it before. The lemon entry, my dear Watson. Look at that. Right, well, it looks That's like we may works. well, we may well, we what? only have 30 seconds. Oh, go for it. Yeah, 30 seconds. 30 yeah. seconds. Here we are. Let's just show the camera this. Oh, a little bit. Beautiful. Garnish. You've got to do that. Yeah, 30 garnish, seconds. Garnish, garnish, garnish. 20 of those. That is well, absolutely garnish, garnish. beautiful. So Take a sip. Go for it. Set the world record for downing a cocktail. How is oh, it? Oh, that is nice. That packs a punch, that does. Mm. Anyway, that is all from us, both <laughs> on Neil Oliver Live. Thank you very much, Robin. Thank and you. people Thank can get in much. touch on the Brilliant. Cocktail Lab. The Cocktail Lab for all your parties and private and corporate events, of course. Now, my thanks, to, as always, to our wonderful oh, panel. That's a joy. And to me, too, of course. Is Neil there? There he is. Hello, everyone. I'm only sorry I can't be with you. Oh, what have you got? Let go in which was a Christmas present to me from a steadfast friend here in Stirling called Graham. Um, it's been love. I, could, I only wish I could be with you in the studio. Uh, and I just, I, I'm very grateful to be looking forward to yet another new year with, uh, with the GB News team. Uh, I can't believe we're going into our third. Uh, that's all from us, as Emily says. Thanks to Tom, thanks to Andrew, uh, and thanks to Robin Navarro. Next up, we look back at what's been an unprecedented year for the Royal Family uh, here at GB News. We've put together a special programme to remember Her Late Majesty. Wishing you a wonderful new year. Good night from all of us, and see you in 2023. <laughs>I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online. This is GB News. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank, fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch-up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Esther McVeigh. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News.
Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Good evening, I'm Ray Addison in the GB Newsroom. Pope Francis has paid tribute to former Pope Benedict, who passed away this morning, aged 95. 